eyes on Great Britain as the Queen's Platinum Jubilee gets underway. A stunning celebration of Her Majesty's 70-year reign. Queen Elizabeth joined by family members on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. A moment of levity as her great-grandson Louis grabbed the world's attention. Buffalo, Uvalde, Tulsa. Once again, we bring you chilling details of a deadly shooting rampage, this time at an Oklahoma hospital. Four people shot dead including a doctor authorities say was targeted by the gunman who blamed him for ongoing pain following back surgery. The accused shooter allegedly bought the assault weapon a little more than an hour before unleashing the horror. Tonight, the president is expected to deliver a prime time address to the nation about the gun violence epidemic terrorizing our country. In Texas, three more final goodbyes to the 21 victims killed in a school shooting more than a week ago. All of those laid to rest today, just children. Investigators have issued their first search warrant seeking access to the gunman's iPhone found next to his body in the hopes of finding some kind of motive. A second front in the war in Ukraine, hunger, a crisis that could potentially be worldwide. How Russian troops are creating a blockage of Ukraine's ports, which act as a lifeline to other countries, and the desperate efforts to get food moving through them. This is the president of Ukraine, says Russia now controls 20% of the country. It's the high-profile trial that recently captured the world's attention. Now that the jury has handed Johnny Depp a win in his defamation case against Amber Heard, Heard's lawyer talks to ABC News Live about the effect this decision could have on victims of domestic abuse. Most women don't have any evidence. They don't have photos, they don't have audios, they don't have videos, and she had quite a bit more. And combine sci-fi with drama and comedy, and you get the one-of-a-kind show, The Orville New Horizons. ABC's Will Reeves sat down with the creator and star Seth MacFarlane about finding a fresh vision for season three. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with a push by President Biden to get common sense gun reform passed by Congress. The president is expected to address the nation at 7.30 Eastern time. We'll, of course, carry his remarks right here live on ABC News Live. The primetime speech comes in the wake of shootings in places that we commonly go to every day, the supermarket, school, most recently a hospital. Let's just take a look at the last eight days since the elementary school shooting in Uvalde. In that time, there have been more than 20 mass shootings, leaving four or more dead or injured, roughly 105 victims shot in those shootings. And again, we are just talking about the span of a week and a day. One of the most recent shootings last night at a Tulsa hospital. And tonight, authorities say the gunman had purchased his AR-15 style assault weapon just hours before the rampage. He was looking for a doctor who police say was among the four killed. And we now know the shooter was also carrying a letter. ABC's John Quinones leads us off from Tulsa. Tonight, Tulsa police say the man who stormed this hospital complex and killed four people had a target. Dr. Preston Phillips, the surgeon who treated him. He came in with the intent to kill Dr. Phillips and anyone who got in his way. Authorities say Dr. Preston Phillips, an orthopedic surgeon at Tulsa's St. Francis Hospital, performed back surgery on Michael Lewis on May 19th. On May 24th, Lewis was released. After release... Lewis called several times over uh, several days complaining of pain and wanted additional treatment. Lewis's last call to the clinic coming just hours before he would allegedly open fire. At 2 p.m. the day of the shooting, the ATF says Lewis bought an AR-style semi-automatic rifle from a local gun store. Just days before, he also bought a 40 caliber semi-automatic handgun, both weapons purchased legally. At 4.52 p.m., hours after buying that gun, the first call to 911 from a patient seeing a doctor over video chat. She was on a video chat with a doctor on the second floor. He told her to call the police. There had been a shooting. One of the victims held the door for someone to allow them to escape out of the back door and was shot and killed. They're running in. Police from multiple agencies swarming and immediately entering the building. Six minutes later at 4.58 p.m., they hear a single gunshot. We believe that was the final gunshot with the suspect taking his own life. Police finding that letter on Lewis, explaining his intent to kill Dr. Phillips. He blamed Dr. Phillips for the ongoing pain following the surgery. 
They find the body of Dr. Phillips in an exam room. Nearby, Dr. Stephanie Hooson and Supervisor Amanda Glenn. Also killed, patient William Love. To think that our caregivers were the victims uh, is just incomprehensible to me. They died while serving others. They died in the line of duty. To the family of Mr. Love, our hearts break for you. I really just wanted this to all be a bad dream, but this is the reality of our world right now. Uh, and today our world and our St. Francis family are devastated. Such a difficult reality for us all. John Quinones joins us now from Tulsa. And John, this shooting comes on the heels of Uvalde, of course, where so many questions still remain on the police response there. But police in Tulsa made a point of saying that they've trained for this kind of scenario. How do they say that they handle things differently? The system just worked perfectly. They said they had rehearsed this time and time again, over and over again. So that led to the response being pretty, pretty impressive. I mean, today, the Tulsa police chief said, our training leads us to take immediate action without hesitation. He said, that's what police officers do. Well, by doing so, they no doubt uh, saved countless lives in the building behind me. We can imagine without hesitation. John Quinones in Tulsa for us. Thanks so much, John. Sure. Thank you, Lindsay. Joining us now for more on the Tulsa mass shooting and what comes next is Tulsa area Congressman Republican Mark Wayne Mullen. Uh, thank you so much for your time tonight, Congressman. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks for having me on. So you were born in Tulsa. Your district is very close to where this hospital is located. Today we learned the shooter bought an AR semi-automatic weapon just a few hours before the shooting and targeted his doctor. Oklahoma does not have a waiting period, as you know, for purchasing guns. Do you think at this point maybe that should be rethought? No, I, I really don't. Um, you know, there's a lot more, I think, to the information that we're getting from uh, from law enforcement all the time about this gentleman's mental capacity, uh, what was happening. But keep in mind, uh, you know, if we're really going to be talking uh, about us upholding the Constitution, which we, every one of us, every member of Congress, uh, we swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States, you got to think about the Second Amendment and its purity. The Second Amendment is the only one that had the full sin. And what I mean by the full sin, it says it shall not be infringed, full stop. I was advocate here for a moment. I mean, the Constitution doesn't say anything about the age, for example, right? It doesn't say right. that you can't increase the limit to 21 in order to buy a gun instead of allowing people to buy guns when they're 18, when they can't even buy cigarettes or alcohol. Right. So is that something that you might consider altering? Well, I, I think it's something that we all got to think about. Uh, it, it, you're absolutely correct, Lindsay. You brought up a good point. It doesn't give the limitations on that. Uh, I think there is somewhat a precedence to which we can go out there and say that we have put limitations on alcohol and we put limitations um, on tobacco uh, and we put limitations on on, on um, people serving in the military. Uh, I think 18, if you're old enough to sign up and, and defend this country with your life at 18 years old, then you're considered an adult in our court of law, then you're also considered an adult to, uh, to purchase a weapon. Uh, and, uh, and, but I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that is something that we should talk about uh, together because it, it doesn't, as I stated before, the constitution doesn't allow for any infringement of the second amendment. A possible bipartisan area of consensus is red flag laws, which 19 states and D.C. currently have on the books. The laws allow police or family in beds to petition a court to temporarily confiscate firearms for an individual. In 2020, Oklahoma became the first state to prohibit red flag laws. What are your views on red flag laws? I think red flag laws uh, leaves a, a, an interpretation to a court that may not be friendly to the Second Amendment. It, it may not be friendly to understanding the Second Amendment as a whole. And so I think they're dangerous. Okay. Now we're talking about the, sh the shooting at, at the at the Nadley Center at, at St. Francis Hospital, where I was born at St. Francis Hospital, obviously not at the Nadley Center. And so when we start talking about situations like that, 
Uh, those are situations to which you can't really control. Someone has a situation to, to where they're going to, uh, they have um, uh, ill will to an individual. There's multiple ways that, that that can be carried out. When we start talking about protecting our kids at our schools, there's also a way that if we're really serious about that, how we can protect our schools immediately. And that's a conversation we should be having. How can we make our schools a hard target? How can we fund federally? How can we fund our schools to make sure that they're no longer a soft target and open to predators, truly predators that want to um, that want to have this this ill-conceived idea that they have power over someone because of mental illness. How can we start securing our schools? And I think the federal government has a role to play in that. And so the conversation is be much deeper than just talking about gun control. So uh, just a really quick question here. For somebody who has a history of mental illness, you feel that they should be able to go in and buy a gun? Do I have that right or am I con misconstruing that? Well, I mean, what is considered mental illness? PTSD sometimes is considered mental illness, right? And these are individuals that have served the country. Just because you have some issues doesn't mean mental illness. So how do you define mental illness? We're still trying to figure out how to even treat mental illness. Very slippery for us to leave that up to our courts because you and I both know our courts never make political decisions. Well, we know that's wrong. Our courts are always ruling on, on political things and they and our judges, for some reason, are constantly putting their personal opinion on a lot of their rulings now. And that is something that I'm not willing to trust the courts with. You've spoken about mental health quite a bit and many agree that more money is necessary there. An analysis of Connecticut's red flag law in place since 1999 found that for every 10 to 20 guns taken away that led to one averted suicide, is a part of mental health ensuring authorities have a way of taking guns away from people who might use them to harm themselves or others? I know you're saying that, you know, it's so broad and everything, but would there even be any line of delineation where you might say somebody who has gone to a therapist and said, you know what, I've been having these visions of, uh, you know, have, performing some kind of mass shooting and, and potentially harming myself. Would you say that that person should still be able to go into a gun store? <laughs> I think it's hard for us to, to, to say that right now. Right now, if it's a criminal, if it's a convicted felon, they shouldn't have a gun. I'll circle back to this, Lindsay. What about securing our schools? What about making schools um, a hard target again? Do you realize there's $123 billion that we put out uh, to COVID to these schools and only 5% of us been, been been spent? What if we were to take that $123 billion and, and, and reappropriate it to these schools and say, Secure your schools with this and have federal standards. Well, I know on how that in Texas they that. did. They did earmark a significant amount of money. Uh, the current governor earmarked a significant amount of money to securing schools and, and tell the parents at, at Robb Elementary what good that money did. Well, I, I haven't, I'm not, not familiar with what the state of Texas did and how they did it. I'm talking about, we're talking about federal fixes, we're talking about protecting our kids at school. And when we start talking about protecting our kids at school, I'm saying this is a role that can make an immediate impact to protecting our kids at school rather than just talking about gun control. Uh, I, what I fear is that the Democrats are using this because it's a political year and they feel like this is a perfect opportunity. We know they've always had a war on the Second Amendment. We've even heard the, what Joe Biden or President Biden has said multiple times about the Second Amendment. Um, I, I, I feel like this is political. What I wanna do is come with the solution. Any areas that both parties that you feel can come together to support federal legislation in addition to what you're talking about in, in securing schools? Well, I, I, I'm not really, it's hard to predict what President Biden is going to say this evening. I, I know what they put their press release that they're going to go after, you know, more gun control, stricter gun control. Um, I, I, I fear, as I said, that the, that the Democrats are going to make this a political issue, uh, much like they do with 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 um, immigration. Uh, I think that they're going to make this a political issue running all the way up to November uh, because it's a it's a personal topic and it's an emotional topic. But what we need, what I'd like to hear from the president is that he leave politics out of it. Uh, don't mix politics with protecting our kids. Surely there's one area that we can agree with and that's that set this subject aside and let's see what we can do immediately, which is why I'm talking about securing our schools. Uh, the, it's always gonna be political when we start talking about how we're going to have gun control when, when people like me believe that the second amendment is true when it says it shall not be infringed, full stop. Uh, so we're not going to get past that point. So what can we do to protect our kids? And that's what I've been proposing is using the COVID relief dollars to secure our schools. Representative Mark Wayne Mullen, we thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you coming on the show.
Lindsay, I appreciate you. Thanks for this interview. Now to Uvalde, Texas. For the first time, we are hearing from the lawyer of a teacher who police initially said left a door open at Robb Elementary School the day that 21 people were killed. Tonight, what they say is the real story of what happened and new details about one teacher's final phone call before she died as three more children are laid to rest. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. As investigators study the moment a gunman appears to slip into Robb Elementary, tonight we are hearing for the first time from the attorney for the teacher who had just walked out that door when she went to retrieve food from a colleague outside. And that door is supposed to always be locked. And so because she thought it was locked, and it always is locked, she propped a rock out to walk a couple feet to get the food. Her attorney says they see the truck crash in front of them, the teacher going back inside and calling 911. He says when the teacher comes back out, she hears witnesses warn he's got a gun. And she sees him throw a bag over the fence, and then he has a, the, the, the assault weapon, the gun hung around his, his chest. He hops the fence and starts running at her. And she's on the phone, and she says, he's got a gun, he's, you know. And so she immediately turns around and runs right back inside, kicks the rock out, slams the door. The teacher, he says, tells 911 what's happening and runs into an empty classroom. And she starts to hear... Pop, 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 Just really fast. Losing contact with 911, she takes cover in that classroom and puts her phone on silent. Guy with a rifle. And now there were more questions about what officers responding to the shooting knew in real time about the wounded victims. Is there anybody inside of the building? Tyler is advising he is in the room full of victims. Full of victims at this moment. At least two students inside that classroom called 911 for help. Uh -oh, eight and we now learn fourth grade teacher Eva Mireles reportedly called her husband Ruben, a school district police officer who was outside but was prevented by other officers from going inside. According to the New York Times, Mireles told him she was dying. Her family says she tried to protect her students before she was shot and killed. Her love was teaching, teaching those young kids and to see them graduate, um, walk the stage and get the diploma. And that was an honor for her. Today, families laying three more children to rest. Ten-year-old Nevea Bravo, a cousin, saying she put a smile on everyone's face. Ten-year-old Eliana Torres, a softball player who hoped to make the all-star team. Her family said her smile could light up your soul, and she loved making people laugh. And Miranda Mathis, seen here receiving an award from her teachers the day of the shooting. Her family saying the 11-year-old had a huge loving heart. So difficult to hear those stories. Our thanks to Marcus. And we turn now to the war in Ukraine, where members of the U.S. military are now training Ukrainians at an undisclosed location on how to use the rocket systems that have now been sent there. It comes as Ukraine's president warns that Russia is gaining ground. Here's ABC's senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel in Kiev for us tonight. Tonight, the U.S. military has begun training Ukrainian troops on an advanced multiple rocket system. A senior defense official confirming it's taking place at an undisclosed location outside the country. It comes as fighting rages in eastern Ukraine. President Zelensky saying the Russians now control one-fifth of the country. Madam Ambassador. In an exclusive interview with ABC News, the new U.S. ambassador, Bridget Brink, acknowledges the fighting is fierce, but not to bet against the Ukrainians. President Zelensky said today that Russia now occupies 20% of Ukrainian territory. Do you believe it's possible to take all that territory back? I think many people wouldn't have believed that it was possible for Ukraine, President Zelensky and, and his military to push Russia out of Kyiv. But the indiscriminate bombing by Russia hasn't stopped. In Kharkiv, yet another school being used as a shelter was shelled, killing one woman. The ever-present dangers of the war clear in an exclusive interview done by Robin Roberts with Ukraine's first lady, Elena Zelenska, an interview interrupted by an air raid warning in Kyiv. That's an air right now. Excuse me, we have to... Please. After taking shelter, the interview resuming 30 minutes later. Zelensky saying Ukrainians truly appreciate American support, but fear a never-ending war if the U.S. becomes complacent about it. Do you have a message for the American people? Окрім великих слів подяки, мені дуже хочеться, щоб весь світ і американці також 
не звикали до цієї війни. Так вона далеко, і вона вже довго триває. І до цього можна звикнути, від цього можна втомитися. Але, будь ласка, не звикайте. Lindsay, that was also the sentiment of the new U.S. ambassador, a need to keep the American people engaged in Ukraine, but also a commitment from the Biden administration to stick by the country however long this takes. Lindsay? Ian, thank you. We are starting to hear more reports now from Amber Heard's camp on just what the actor's last 24 hours have been like since the verdict. A gleeful Johnny Depp posted a statement reading in part from the very beginning. The goal of bringing this case was to reveal the truth regardless of the outcome. Speaking the truth was something that I owed to my children and to all those who have remained steadfast in their support of me. I feel at peace knowing I have finally accomplished that. I got a chance to sit down with Amber Heard's attorney, Elaine Charlson Bedhoff, to discuss the verdict and some of the evidence they were not allowed to present. So 24 hours after the verdict, how is Amber holding up? You know, she's heartbroken. But I have to say one of the most significant things she said right after she heard the verdict was, I am so sorry for all these women I have disappointed, all these women who have suffered, you know, and I've set them back. Obviously, this is a big setback. And she feels personally responsible for it. So she's working through it, but it's a tough one. So you would say that the social media outweighed potentially for some of the jurors, even what they witnessed for themselves. Yes, yes. And the combination of that and not being able to get a lot of very significant evidence in smoking guns. We had some significant text messages from Johnny Depp's assistant saying, when I told him that he kicked you, he cried. That didn't come in. We had uh, the medical records that, that actually where Amber was reporting contemporaneously about the drugs, the alcohol, and being physically abused. Those didn't come in. Anything that was positive in the medical records where she was reporting the abuse didn't come in, only if she said something that was potentially negative. All of that had to be difficult for them when they go back to the jury room and they're only seeing one side. And now there are plans to appeal Yes. On what grounds? Uh, there's a number of them. Obviously, we think that the fact of the UK judgment should have come in. We also think the UK judgment should have precluded the complaint. We think uh, there would have been a uh, defensive uh, collateral estoppel should have, because it was Mr. Depp's case over in the UK, the standard of proof was even easier for him, and he still lost. He put in all the evidence he wanted, he put all the witnesses he wanted, still lost. We think that should have precluded this case. We also think there was a number of significant evidentiary issues, hearsay. You probably heard the entire world heard hearsay, and we think a lot of things were excluded that should not have been. So we do think we have some significant grounds. After you've been having a front row seat to this and an active participant in it what would your message be to victims of domestic abuse who now say well this is it I'm not going to come forward with my own story I w my advice would be document as much as you can and that's difficult because knowing the cycle of violence and we had some outstanding experts in this case the cycle of violence and it was true of amber as well she wanted to protect him she loved him she believed she could get him off the alcohol and the drugs that's what goes through all of them but i my advice would be tell people tell your therapists amber did but we couldn't get the evidence in take pictures, document things if you need to, because we recognize it. We really have had a quite a, quite a setback. We really have gone back, I, I want to say almost decades. Those who watched on TikTok seem to come away with this idea that, that Johnny Depp was cast as the hero and Amber Heard is the villain. Why do you think that was, that, that so many people took that attitude? He's a very powerful figure. You know, as, as Captain Jack Sparrow, he was exceedingly popular. He made over $650 million as an actor. He was very, very wealthy, very powerful, had a very, very strong cult following, and has continued to have that strong cult following. Amber doesn't have that. She's been working her way up. She's much younger than he is. She's been just working her way to the levels of success. She does, it's just such an uneven playing field to start out with. And these people have stayed with Mr. Depp and they have supported him. Do you feel that domestic violence is still something that's difficult for our court systems to adequately respond to and address? Yes. 
Yes, and, you know, it was very helpful to have uh, Don Hughes, Dr. Hughes, testify. She's a specialist in interpersonal and in intimate partner uh, violence uh, for uh, 25 years. We also had Dr. Spiegel, a psychiatrist who had those specialties. And it was helpful to have them there because it's so difficult for the typical person to understand the cycle of violence and understand why these victims stay. They're getting beaten up, they're, you know, um, choked, they're almost getting killed, and yet they stay and they remain loyal and they love this person. And what Mr. Depp's legal team did in strategy here was play to the ignorance of people who don't get that. Why would she do this if he was beating her? Why would she say, you know, give him love letters if he's beating her? Why would she give him a knife if he's beating her? And that's what they played to. And I think a lot of people need better education on that. The First Amendment. I, I'm very troubled by the fact that we have an op-ed that doesn't even mention Mr. Depp. And as a result of that, this jury has now said that these were defamatory with malice, even though Amber had a lawyer who gave her advice on it. Um, and what that does to chill virtually everyone out there, and it's not just domestic violence, I, I think it's virtually anything, we're all fair game on, under this kind of an interpretation. And I think we have to really rethink the First Amendment and op-eds and how we treat these going forward. In theory, do I have a right to talk about a really bad experience I had with a person or a business as long as I don't name them? Your takeaway from this verdict is no, you can be sued for defamation. And that, that's wrong and that's why we need to appeal and we need to make this right. And when we come back, Great Britain goes all out for the Royal Jubilee celebration of Queen Elizabeth II. We'll take you there. Michael Avenatti faces justice for defrauding his former client, Stormy Daniels. And an inside look at the efforts in Ukraine to prevent a global food crisis as the war blocks getting out that country's critical grain supplies. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go anytime free download the abc news app now breaking news exclusives 24 7 there for you with one touch the abc news app download it now america's number one news abc news most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
Welcome back. The war in Ukraine is now leading to another growing crisis, hunger, a pain that could be widespread beyond just Europe. Russian troops are blocking Ukraine's ports, preventing the distribution of food, a lifeline to other countries. Intense international diplomatic efforts are now happening to end the blockage. But in the meantime, farmers are bearing the brunt of this aspect of the conflict. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge takes us to the front lines with rare access into a stalled grain port. The war in Ukraine has a second front. Ukrainian farms normally feeding millions abroad, their produce stuck. It's just a disaster, and I mean, uh, especially for the coming year, you know, if we don't open the ports soon, our crops out here, we can't export them. Russia threatening Ukraine's coastline, so vital food exports in Ukrainian ports going nowhere causing hunger in some of the poorest parts of the world. The Ukraine war has just overnight basically taken the fifth biggest player off the market. World leaders trying to broker a deal. The Pope speaking out, saying hunger should not be used as a weapon of war. Ukraine is a giant agricultural production house. Ukrainian food exports normally feeding 400 million people around the world each year, according to the UN. We're talking about everyday products. Ukraine produces almost half of global exports of sunflower oil. Barley, corn and wheat, big numbers too. This is an ABC News special report. Good evening, I'm David Muir, and we're coming on the air at this hour because President Biden is about to address the nation after a series of horrific mass shootings in this country, an epidemic of gun violence in the U.S. The images, as you know at home, have been heartbreaking and have become, sadly, far too familiar in this country. From that grocery store in Buffalo, New York, to a church in Laguna Woods, California, to Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, and now, of course, this hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in just the last 24 hours. In fact, this number tonight, in just the eight days since Uvalde, there have been 20 mass shootings since the killing of those 19 school children and two teachers at Robb Elementary. Three more children there were laid to rest just today. The president tonight is expected to ask Congress to pass common sense gun laws to combat the violence taking lives every day in this country. There are already bipartisan talks underway in the Senate, mostly focusing on red flag laws and some sort of expanded background checks. It remains unclear if there are enough Republican votes to get any of this passed. The number of active shooter incidents growing exponentially over the last two decades here in the U.S. Let's listen to the president addressing the nation on the gun violence. On Memorial Day this past Monday, Jill and I visited Arlington National Cemetery. As we entered those hallowed grounds, we saw rows and rows of crosses among the rows of headstones with other emblems of belief, honoring those who paid the ultimate price on battlefields around the world. The day before, we visited Uvalde, Uvalde, Texas. In front of Robb Elementary School, we stood before 21 crosses for 19 third and fourth graders and two teachers. On each cross, a name, and nearby, a photo of each victim that Jill and I reached out to touch. Innocent victims murdered in a classroom that had been turned into a killing field. Standing there in that small town, like so many other communities across America, I couldn't help but think there are too many other schools, too many other everyday places that have become killing fields, battlefields here in America. We stood at such a place just 12 days before, across from a grocery store in Buffalo, New York, memorializing 10 fellow Americans, a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, gone forever. At both places, we spent hours with hundreds of family members who were broken and whose lives will never be the same. They had one message for all of us, do something, just do something. For God's sake, do something. After Columbine, after Sandy Hook, after Charleston, after Orlando, after Las Vegas, after Parkland, nothing has been done. This time, that can't be true. 
This time, we, we must actually do something. The issue we face is one of conscience and common sense. For so many of you at home, I want to be very clear. This is not about taking away anyone's guns. It's about vil not about vilifying gun, o gun owners. In fact, we believe we should be treating responsible gun owners as an example of how every gun owner should behave. I respect the culture and the tradition and the concerns of lawful gun owners. At the same time, the Second Amendment, like all other rights, is not absolute. It was, just, it was Justice Scalia who wrote, and I quote, like most rights, the right Second Amendment, by the, the rights granted by the Second Amendment are not unlimited. Not unlimited. It never has been. There have always been limitations on what weapons you can own in America. For example, machine guns have been federally regulated for nearly 90 years, and this is still a free country. This isn't about taking to anyone's rights. It's about protecting children. It's about protecting families. It's about protecting whole communities. It's about protecting our freedom to go to school, to a grocery store, to a church, without being shot and killed. According to new data just released by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, guns are the number one killer of children in the United States of America. The number one killer more than car accidents, more than cancer. Over the last two decades, more school-age children have died from guns than on-duty police officers and active-duty military combined. Think about that. More kids than on-duty cops killed by guns. More kids than soldiers killed by guns. For God's sake, how much more carnage are we willing to accept? How many more innocent American lives must be taken before we say enough, enough? I know that we can't prevent every tragedy, but here's what I believe we have to do. Here's what the overwhelming majority of American people believe we must do. Here's what the families in Buffalo and Uvalde in Texas told us we must do. We need to ban assault weapons in high-capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks. Enact safe storage law and red flag laws. Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. Address the mental health crisis, deepening the trauma of gun violence and as a consequence of that violence. These are rational common-sense measures. Here's what it all means. It all means this. We should reinstate the assault weapons ban in high-capacity magazines that we passed in 1994 with bipartisan support in Congress and the support of law enforcement. Nine categories of semi-automatic weapons were included in that ban, like AK-47s and AR-15s. And in the 10 years it was law, mass shootings went down. But after Republicans let the law expire in 2004, and those weapons were allowed to be sold again, mass shootings tripled. Those are the facts. A few years ago, the family of the inventor of the AR-15 said he would have been horrified to know that its design was being used to slaughter children and other innocent lives instead of being used as a military weapon on the battlefields, as it was designed. That's what it was dying for. Enough. Enough. We should limit how many rounds a weapon can hold. <clears throat> Why, in God's name, should an ordinary citizen be able to purchase an assault weapon that holds 30-round magazines that let mass shooters fire hundreds of bullets in a matter of minutes? The damage was so devastating in Uvalde Parents had to do DNA swabs to identify the remains of their children. Nine and ten-year-old children. Enough. We should expand background checks to be, keep guns out of the hands of felons, fugitives, and those under restraining orders. 
Stronger background checks are something that the vast majority of Americans, including the majority of gun owners, agree on. I also believe we should have safe storage laws and personal liability for not locking up your gun. The shooter in Sandy Hook came from a home full of guns. They were too easy to access. That's how he got the weapons. The weapon he used to kill his mother and then murdered 26 people, including 20 first graders. If you own a weapon, you have a responsibility to secure it. Every responsible gun owner agrees to make sure no one else can have access to it, to lock it up, to have trigger locks. And if you don't, and something bad happens, you should be held responsible. We should also have national red flag laws so that a parent, a teacher, a counselor can flag for a court that a child, a student, a patient is exhibiting violent tendencies, threatening classmates, or experiencing suicidal thoughts that makes them a danger to themselves or to others. Nineteen states in the District of Columbia have red flag laws. The Delaware law is named after my son, Attorney General Bo Biden. Fort Hood, Texas, 2009, 13 dead and more than 30 injured. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, 2018, 17 dead, 17 injured. In both places, countless others suffering with invisible wounds. Red flag laws could have stopped both these shooters. In Uvalde, the shooter was 17 when he asked his sister to buy him an assault weapon. Knowing he'd be denied because he was too young to purchase one himself, she refused. But as soon as he turned 18, he purchased two assault weapons for himself. Because in Texas, you can be 18 years old and buy an assault weapon, even though you can't buy a pistol in Texas until you're 21. If we can't ban assault weapons as we should, we must at least raise the age to be able to purchase one to 21. Look, I know for some folks will say 18-year-olds can serve in the military and fire those weapons. But that's with training and supervision by the best trained experts in the world. Don't tell me raising the age won't make a difference. Enough. We should repeal the liability shield that often protects gun manufacturers from being sued for the death and destruction caused by their weapons. They're the only industry in this country that has that kind of immunity. Imagine, imagine if the tobacco industry had been immune from being sued, where we'd be today. The gun industry special protections are outrageous. It must end. And let there be no mistake about the psychological trauma that gun violence leaves behind. Imagine being that little girl, that brave little girl in Uvalde, who smeared blood off her murdered friend's body on her own face to lie still among the corpses in her classroom and pretend she was dead in order to stay alive. Imagine, imagine what it would be like for her to walk down the hallway of any school again. Imagine what it's like for children who experience this kind of trauma every day in school, in the streets, in communities all across America. Imagine what it's like for so many parents to hug their children goodbye in the morning, not sure whether they'll come back home. Unfortunately, too many people don't have to imagine that at all. Even before the pandemic, young people were already hurting. There's a serious youth mental health crisis in this country. We have to do something about it. That's why mental health is the heart of my unity agenda that I laid out in the State of the Union address this year. We must provide more school counselors, more school nurses, more mental health services for students and for teachers, more people volunteering as mentors to help young people succeed, more privacy protection and resources to keep kids safe from the harms of social media. This unity agenda won't fully heal the wounded souls, but it will help. It matters. I just told you what I'd do. The question now is, what will the Congress do? The House of Representatives already passed key measures we need. Expanding background checks to cover nearly all gun sales, including at gun shows and online sales. Getting rid of the loophole 
allows a gun sale to go through after three business days, even if the background check has not been completed. And the House is planning even more action next week. Safe storage requirements, the banning of high-capacity magazines, raising the age to buy an assault weapon to 21, federal red flag law, codifying my ban on ghost guns that don't have serial numbers and can't be traced, and tougher laws to prevent gun trafficking and straw purchases. This time, we have to take the time to do something. And this time, it's time for the Senate to do something. But as we know, in order to do any, get anything done in the Senate, we need a minimum of 10 Republican senators. I support the bipartisan efforts that include a small group of Democrats and Republican senators trying to find a way. But my God, the fact that the majority of the Senate Republicans don't want any of these proposals even to be debated or come up for a vote, I find unconscionable. We can't fail the American people again. Since Uvalde, just over a week ago, there have been 20 other mass shootings in America, each with four or more people killed or injured, including yesterday at a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a shooter deliberately targeted a surgeon using an assault weapon he bought just a few hours before his rampage that left the surgeon, another doctor, a receptionist, and a patient dead and many more injured. That doesn't count the carnage we see every single day. It doesn't make the headlines. I've been in this fight for a long time. I know how hard it is, but I'll never give up. And if Congress fails, I believe this time a majority of the American people won't give up either. I believe the majority of you will act to turn your outrage into making this issue central to your vote. Enough, enough, enough. Over the next 17 days, the families in Uvalde will continue burying their dead. It will take that long in part because it's a town where everyone knows everyone. And day by day, they will honor each one they lost. Jill and I met with the owner and staff of the funeral home as being strong, 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 strong to take care of their own. And the people of Uvalde mourn as they do over the next 17 days. What will we be doing as a nation? Jill and I met with the sister of the teacher who was murdered and whose husband died of a heart attack two days later, leaving behind four beautiful orphan children, and all now orphaned. The sister asked us, what could she say? What could she tell her nieces and nephews? It's the most heartbreaking moments that I can remember. All I could think to say was, I told her to hold them tight. Hold them tight. After visiting the school, we attended Mass at Sacred Heart Catholic Church with Father Eddie. In the pews, families and friends held each other tightly. As Archbishop Gustavo spoke, he asked the children in attendance to come up on the altar and sit in the altar with him as he spoke. There wasn't enough room, so mom and her young son sat next to Jill and me in the first pew. And as we left the church, a grandmother who had just lost her granddaughter passed me a handwritten letter. It read, quote, Erase the invisible line that is dividing our nation. Come up with a solution and fix what's broken and make the changes that are necessary to prevent this from happening again. End of quote. My fellow Americans, enough. Enough. It's time for each of us to do our part. It's time to act for the children we've lost, the children we can save, for the nation we love. Let's hear the call and the cry. Let's meet the moment. Let us finally do something. God bless the families who are hurting. God bless you all. From him, based on the 91st Psalm sung in my church, may he raise you up on eagle's wings and bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you 
in the palm of his hand. That's my prayer for all of you. God bless you. President Biden at the White House tonight with his request for Congress and his thoughts for the American people and in particular for the communities that have suffered unspeakable loss in these last few weeks. He spoke of his visits with the First Lady to Buffalo and Uvalde and he said the families that they spoke with, they had one message for us all, do something, just do something. He spoke of Columbine, Sandy Hook, Orlando, Las Vegas, and the shootings we have faced in this country in just the last couple of weeks, and he said, we have done nothing. He also added, I want to make it very clear, and these were the president's words, he said, I'm not about taking away anyone's guns. In fact, we believe we should be treating responsible gun owners as an example of how every gun owner should behave in this country. And then he laid it out. Here's what the president wants to happen in this country. He said, we need a ban assault weapons in this country. Uh, and if we can't do that, he said, we must raise the age from 18 to 21 to buy those assault-style rifles that have been used in these mass shootings, particularly in these last couple of weeks. He said we must strengthen background checks, strengthen red flag warnings, get rid of immunity for gun manufacturers, and mental health crisis, the help for people who are suffering uh, in this country. I want to bring in Mary Bruce at the White House. Mary, you heard the president there say, I've been in this fight for a long time, and, and that's an understatement. We remember when President Obama named then Vice President uh, Joe Biden to lead the effort uh, after Sandy Hook. David, Joe Biden knows this fight well, and he knows what an uphill battle it is. He knows all well the political reality that he is facing. And, you know, it, it strikes me listening to this that what Biden said then 10 years ago, after 20 children were massacred and he was put in charge by President Obama to lead this charge for gun reforms, what he said then is very similar, almost exactly the same to what he said tonight. Is this time it? Is this time going to be enough? This time 19 children killed. Is this going to finally spur Washington to act? And he knows that, unfortunately, Unfortunately, in the past, it simply hasn't. It doesn't seem that anything has been enough. And, you know, I asked the president just yesterday, is he confident that this time will be just that? Will this be different? And he said to me very bluntly, he is never confident. He knows that even though they are encouraged by the fact that there are at least talks, that at least Washington seems to be willing to try and do something, he knows that this is still a, a real long shot, despite the violence that we continue to see in this country. And, and David, this speech tonight was aimed, of course, at the American people, but also also at lawmakers, because the president knows that in order to keep up the pressure on Washington, he has to come out and deliver speeches like this and remind the American public and the people listening up on Capitol Hill that the majority of Americans want to see some change here. Well, stay with us here, Mary. You bring up Capitol Hill, so let's go there next. Rachel Scott on the Hill for us again tonight. And Rachel, every night you've been reporting here on these talks. It's a small group of senators, bipartisan senators. We know uh, Congress in recess, but they have been meeting over Zoom. You, you reported on this. What's on the table here? What's potentially viable? Well, David, some of what the president outlined tonight, some of it, not all of it, is on the table in these bipartisan discussions that have been playing out in the Senate. We know that expanding background checks, for one, is something that senators are discussing. They are also discussing red flag laws, which would temporarily take away guns from people who are considered dangerous, or possibly providing an incentive like grants to states who enact or boost or bolden those red flag laws. Republicans also want to see more money for school security for mental health. And as Mary points out, the majority of Americans do want something done on this issue. The majority of Americans do support expanded background checks. They do support red flag laws. But of course, this will be an uphill challenge. These talks are very delicate because Democrats need the support of at least 10 Republicans in order to get any legislation passed in the Senate, David. Yeah, that's the political reality. And when you talk about the majority of Americans, we're not talking about a simple majority. This is the vast majority in the polling across the board uh, in in recent years on this. Rachel, a quick follow to you because you mentioned uh, stronger background checks, perhaps stronger red flag warnings are on the table with these bipartisan senators. Of course, you, you mentioned there's a major hurdle because they would then need to get significant Republican support even for that. But you heard the president there talk about banning assault weapons uh, in this country. Uh, take Texas, for example, where we know uh, the suspect authorities say turned 18. The next day he bought that AR-15 style rifle. Would anything you're hearing being discussed right now affect a purchase like that? 
You know, David, it may not have been enough to stop the suspects in Texas, but the president pointed out that it may have been enough to stop other suspects and other mass shootings that have happened in this country. Democrats do want to go further. They want to ban assault weapons outright. They do want to raise the legal age limit required to purchase an AR-15 style weapon. But I could tell you I've been talking to a lot of Republican sources over the course of the last few days, and for them, that is a non-starter. So Democrats know that they may not be able to get everything, but they want to be able to get something here. 30 years of congressional inaction on this issue, David, and they want this time to be different. Yeah, just to underscore that one point you just made, this notion the president said to raise the age in the country from 18 to 21 on these AR-15 style weapons, that's off the table for Republicans? Off the table, from what I am told from Republican sources in the Senate, that is something that they do not want. That is a non-starter for them at this point, David. All right, Rachel Scott, who continues to report this out from Capitol Hill for us. Rachel, thank you. Let's bring in our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas in Washington as well. Pierre, we heard the President say this again. He has said this in the recent weeks after previous mass shootings and now uh, after Tulsa has been added to the list here. He, he said once again that we should reinstate the assault weapons ban that passed in 94 with bipartisan support. We know that lasted 10 years. Uh, it was allowed to expire uh, when Republicans were uh, in control. Uh, he talked about the stats after it expired. He said mass shootings went down while the assault weapons ban was in effect. When they expired in 2004, he said those weapons were allowed to be sold again. Mass shootings have tripled. Has our team had time to fact check that? David, we think he's citing a New York University study showing a slight decrease in mass shootings when the assault weapons ban was in place and a surge in a decade right after it was uh, allowed to lapse. And in fact, we know we've seen a dramatic rise in mass shootings recently, so that is not in debate, David. And one other thing, Pierre, while we have you, you know, it's something you've been reporting out for for many, many weeks now, even before these most recent mass shootings, you were telling us that law enforcement sources, uh, they're aware, obviously, of this problem of gun violence in the country, of these mass shootings, but they're, uh, they're, there's a double concern right now because of the pandemic this country has been living through. Two and a half years now, uh, the mental health toll on top of what we already know are people uh, suffering uh, and, and an issue with weapons in this country that they think that you were telling us they were warning that this could be a very difficult summer ahead. In fact, David, they've been talking about how the pandemic exacerbated what I call the misery index and others call the misery index, that people are unstable, they're angry, and they have an incredible access to guns, which sales have been skyrocketing in recent years. So it's a interesting, terrible convergence the sources are talking about. And David, they have been warning repeatedly that this lone wolf factor of people who have all kinds of different kinds of grievances from, you know, anger about, you know, politics to, you know, mental health issues. They are now taking access to these weapons and going out and killing people. The FBI director said it is our most imminent threat. Pierre Thomas with us as well. Thank you. I want to bring in Marcus Moore in Texas tonight. He's in San Antonio. Marcus, you heard the president there say you can't buy a pistol in Texas, but you can buy an AR-15 style rifle that we saw used in, in Uvalde. This uh, suspect had turned 18, went to buy it uh, the next day, bought another weapon a couple of, uh, of days later. Uh, Governor Abbott in Texas uh, had supported at one point in recent years uh, red flag warnings of some sort that perhaps might have set up some sort of red flag with this suspect or, or perhaps with others, but that fell by the wayside? Yeah, it did. Uh, that was in response, uh, David, to the, the, the shooting there um, at the school in Santa Fe uh, back in 2018. Ten people uh, were killed there. And at the time, he asked lawmakers to uh, consider uh, perhaps red flag laws, putting those on the books, or at least to investigate and explore uh, whether or not those types of laws would be effective here and uh, essentially taking uh, guns or allowing the courts to take guns away from anyone who is deemed a threat uh, to others or to themselves. Themselves. Uh, he didn't particularly or specifically endorse that, uh, that idea, but he did ask lawmakers to consider it. Um, it faced pushback. And it kind of just fizzled out, um, as it were. Nothing um, happened with that with that law. And now, once again, it does beg the question: uh, Could it 
have prevented uh, the shooting here. And, and David, I do want to point out, we are in Texas, and this is a state that has seen a number of mass shootings. In 2017, the church shooting in Sutherland Springs, 26 people were killed. Uh, and you'll recall the shooting in El Paso, where 23 people were killed at a store. And so this is something that we're once again uh, here in Texas. They are enduring uh, yet another mass shooting. And many people asking uh, what can be done. And they are looking to legislators to, to do something, as we heard the president say. Marcus Moore in Texas for us. Marcus, thank you. Uh, one final question before we go tonight, and for that we go back to the White House and Mary Bruce, because I think uh, we're always reminded we're in a country right now exhausted, exhausted by it all. The pandemic, by these mass shootings, by so many of the other issues we face in, in these times. Is the president, is this White House hopeful that even though they're aware of the political hurdles here, that perhaps, perhaps this exhaustion in the country will be recognized by lawmakers in Washington? That's certainly the hope, and I do think they see some cause for, for optimism, even if it is just slight optimism. You know, the fact that they're, they're even talking right now is a good sign for this White House. It is interesting the president himself has not been directly involved in those talks yet. When I've pressed the White House and asked why not, they say he wants to give Congress space right now to see if they can find some shreds of common ground. But I think we have to be realistic. Right now, the president and the top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, don't even agree on the problem. Mitch McConnell says that this is an issue of mental health and school safety. And and whether they are going to be able to come together is still a huge X factor. The president outlining his demands tonight, but David, those are demands he's been making for decades, demands that he has been making through several rounds of unsuccessful efforts in this fight. The question now, can they find common ground and just how meaningful and impactful will it be? Mary, thank you. Three final images here before I go. Let's take a look. These are the faces of the children in Uvalde, fourth graders going to funerals now for their friends. In Tulsa overnight, the hospital, and in Buffalo, of course, the top supermarket. We are thinking about all of those families. I'm David Muir. Good night. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It, of course, has been a grim few weeks for our nation. Ted dead in Buffalo, 21, most of them children in Uvalde, Texas, and those four lives just lost last night in Tulsa. In fact, there have been 20 other mass shootings across the country just since the horror unfolded in Uvalde eight days ago. But as we all know, the crisis has gone on for years. And tonight, President Biden addressed the nation about this rash of violence and questioned if this is the moment that America will act. Here's a bit of what he had to say. For God's sake, do something. After Columbine, after Sandy Hook, after Charleston, after Orlando, after Las Vegas, after Parkland, nothing has been done. This time, that can't be true. This time, we, we must actually do something. This is not about taking away anyone's guns. It's about vil not about vilifying gun, on gun owners. In fact, we believe we should be treating responsible gun owners as an example of how every gun owner should behave. I respect the culture and the tradition and the concerns of lawful gun owners. At the same time, the Second Amendment, like all other rights, is not absolute. We need to ban assault weapons in high-capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks, enact safe storage law and red flag laws, Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. Address the mental health crisis, deepening the trauma of gun violence and as a consequence of that violence. Of course, that was there. There was the poignant moment from the president where he said, my fellow Americans, enough. Uh, he talked about hearing the chants from the crowds in Uvalde that were saying, do something, do something to protect our freedoms and the right to just be able to go simply to the supermarket or to a church without being shot. Of course, ABC News Live is bringing you complete coverage of the president's remarks tonight. We begin with our senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. And Mary, certainly some strong words from the president tonight about the tragic gun violence that our nation has experienced, in particular, in the past two weeks. Yeah, a really forceful call to action from the president. The question, though, is will you actually see that action? You know, the president saying again tonight, is this time going to be different? Does this 
killing of 19 children in Texas and the nearly more at least 20 mass shootings since then. Is that going to be enough finally to get Washington to act? But, you know, Joe Biden is someone who has been saying that uh, for decades, and he knows well, having been someone who has been out in front of this fight for gun reforms, just how difficult this really is. You know, he, in fact, said that same the, the same phrase this time has to be different uh, after the Sandy Hook massacre when then President Obama put him in charge uh, of the response to that massacre. And then we saw nothing happen. And the president knows that there is a real chance that that could happen again. And he is using this speech and his megaphone as the president to try and keep up this fight, to try and keep up the pressure on Congress. And, and this was a speech very much for the American people, but also for members of Congress to try and uh, push them to finally take action. You know, we the White House has been encouraged, they've said, by the fact that you are finally at least seeing lawmakers willing to talk, uh, which may seem like a small step, but is actually pretty big in the grand scheme of things here in Washington. But when I asked the president yesterday if he's confident that this time will actually be different, that Congress will finally do something on this issue, the president was blunt and he told me he's never confident. You know, in Mary Bruce, many people are talking about the fact that we had the Prime Minister of Canada, Trudeau, on Monday just make this unilateral decision that we're going to freeze gun sales, for example, in uh, Canada. It doesn't seem, as you talked about how President Biden, he has a megaphone, but not that unilateral ability. He needs uh, the Senate to act here. What has he been doing, though, however, in addition to using that microphone in the bully pulpit, what has he been doing behind the scenes in order to try to get something to make this time different. It's a really good question. You know, there is only so much the president can do, of course. And when it comes to executive actions, he's pretty much exhausted much of what he can do. The White House has said, look, they're looking in to other areas where he may be able to take action on his own. But when it comes to really doing what is the most meaningful and most impactful, that's up to Congress. And the president, we are told, has not been really directly involved in these latest talks and negotiations. And when I've pressed the White House on why not, uh, they've said that the president wants to give them the space to try and find common ground. Uh, that is a strategy that, that we have seen over and over again in the past. It hasn't worked in the past. So it'll be interesting to see how long the president sort of uh, stays on the side and lets his teams uh, work, work the phones, so to speak. Uh, but the president is using his biggest tool here, which is simply going before the cameras, speaking directly to the American people and reminding Congress that these kinds of changes, uh, many of them have the backing, not just, you know, of a slight majority, but, but, a, but a really meaningful majority of Americans who are calling and demanding this kind of change. What is interesting is while the president outlined his demands, right, raising the minimum age, background checks, red flag laws, an assault weapons ban, a lot of those things, the assault weapons ban, is simply not even on the table or in the realm of discussions right now. Uh, but those are all demands that the president has outlined in the past. The question remains, where can they find common ground? What kind of compromise would be enough for the president and Democrats to feel that they're actually making change? And will they agree on something that really uh, can have a difference in finally stopping some of these horrific massacres in this country. Mary Bruce from the White House, thanks so much. We want to bring that conversation to our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, when we're talking about finding that common ground. And, and Rachel, first, we just want to listen to what the president just said about the political realities Congress is facing. It's time for the Senate to do something. But as we know, in order to do any, get anything done in the Senate, we need a minimum of 10 Republican senators. I support the bipartisan efforts that include small group of Democrats and Republican senators trying to find a way. But my God, the fact that the majority of the Senate Republicans don't want any of these proposals even to be debated or come up for a vote, I find unconscionable. We can't fail the American people again. Hey, Rachel, the president making it clear he wants the Senate to act. Bring us up to speed on how those bipartisan talks are going in the Senate so far. Right. And Lindsay, I think it's so notable there. You hear the president's outrage because there are two background check bills that have already passed the House that are still sitting in the Senate and have not been called to the floor for a vote because the votes just are not there for those two measures. Congress is out on recess, but a small bipartisan group of senators have been speaking by phone over Zoom, trying to hash out if there's anything that they can sort of reach common ground on. And some of what the president has outlined tonight is is being discussed and it is on the table. One of those things is expanding background checks, though 
Democratic sources I spoke to today say they, that may be more narrow than they originally had hoped. Another thing that they are discussing is red flag laws. This would temporarily take guns away from people who are considered dangerous. They are discussing possibly providing grants or incentives to states who enact these red flag laws. Republicans also want to see funding for mental health, for school security. It's worth noting here, though, Lindsay, polls show that the majority of Americans support universal background checks and red flag laws. But here on Capitol Hill in the Senate, Democrats need the support of at least 10 Republicans in order to get any legislation passed. And that will certainly be an uphill battle for them, Lindsay. Yeah, we can imagine. And Rachel, even if a breakthrough is announced, clearly there would still be a long way to go until the finish line. A long way to go, Lindsay. Listen, right now, the two sides are talking, and that is progress up here on Capitol Hill. We are in very divisive times where Democrats and Republicans are not always talking to each other about legislation, about a pathway forward. So the fact that this week, while Congress is on recess, they've been communicating by phone, that there have been group Zoom calls on this issue is a step in the right direction. But Democrats and Republicans will be the first ones to tell you that they have certainly been here before. After mass shootings, we have seen them come to the table and then we have seen them leave the table. No action. There have been 30 years of congressional inaction on this issue. Democrats want this time to be different. They want to go even bigger. They want an assault weapons ban. They want to raise the legal age limit to purchase an AR-15 style rifle from 18 to 21, but they know the Republican support in the Senate just is not there. So they'd rather get something over nothing, Lindsay. Rachel Scott reporting in from the Capitol. Thanks so much as always, Rachel. And now let's turn to our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas in Washington for us. And Pierre, uh, just wanted to get a sense here. The president pointing out some stark numbers there on how mass shootings are impacting our country, especially for children caught in the crossfire. He talked about how guns are the number one killer of children before even car accidents or cancer. Uh, they are indeed, and every day uh, we see children, uh, sometimes in the dozens, being killed in this country uh, in a variety of scenarios. It could be domestic violence cases. It could be also caught in the crossfire in urban scenarios. Children are a target. Hundreds being killed you know, annually. Uh, these are stunning numbers. Uh, I can think of cases, Lindsay, in recent months. The child in the backseat of his car killed on a highway with his mother. Uh, a story out of Philadelphia this week that just breaks your heart of a mom coming out of the house after hearing gunfire, only to find her husband and her nine year old son shot. They both died. We also heard uh, President Biden tonight talk about the mental health crisis, the need uh, to have more counselors. You've, of course, talked about the, the increase in mass shootings in recent years. What is law enforcement saying as far as that's concerned? Well, the surge in gun violence has coincided with the pandemic, really beginning in 2019, uh, particularly surging into 2020. You saw a 30 percent increase in the number of homicides, mainly gun homicides. That's an increase of over 5,000 homicides in one year. They say that that has been coupled with a surge in gun sales, and you now have a situation where the evil, the, un the unstable and the just plain criminal now have incredible access to guns. And I'll leave you with this thought, Lindsay. The FBI director uh, said uh, last week that the most imminent threat to the American public are lone wolf actors who have a variety of grievances, everything from anger about their job to being radicalized to being just unstable. They're getting weapons and they're going out and using them. Just fascinating information there. Pierre Thomas, our, our thanks to you. And now we go to San Antonio, just a little more than 80 miles away from Uvalde is our Marcus Moore. And Marcus, you've, of course, been on the ground there talking to the victims of loved ones and uh, the, the loved ones who are, are still struggling to really get their mind around I exactly what happened in the community there in Uvalde. Are they wanting to talk about policy change right now and demanding that change, or are they still just simply focusing on the, the loss and, and the pain that they're currently experiencing? Yeah, yeah, Lindsay, I mean, they are absolutely uh, focusing on, on their children uh, who they lost uh, so tragically and, and so suddenly uh, just last week. But you certainly, when talking to people here in, in Texas and in particular in Uvalde this week, 
the question almost naturally, or the conversation rather, almost naturally always goes to what needs to happen uh, to prevent this from happening again. And the ideas that people uh, believe will work um, are varied. There are some who um, very much support uh, gun restrictions and that uh, assault rifles and weapons should be should be banned while there are others who say that the focus should be uh, placed squarely on on mental health and providing funding uh, and and really uh, addressing that part uh, of the issue uh, but nobody uh, believes that there is a single fix to this right um, it is a very complicated issue uh, but at the heart of it uh, lives are being lost here and uh, the people in uvalde this week are the ones who are, are now acutely uh, aware of that that reality and Marcus, are, are people on the ground, obviously, you know, when we're talking about the shooting in Buffalo and also the, the, the shooting at Robb Elementary in there, uh, there in Uvalde, uh, we're talking about 18-year-olds. Are, are people in Texas talking about uh, the need to change the age? Because obviously you can't even buy uh, a handgun at, at 18, but you can buy a, an assault weapon. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that is that's one of the ideas that we've heard from people here. They do believe that the the minimum age should be raised to uh, at least 21. I've heard some people say 25, um, and that's uh, one of the proposals that was put into a letter that uh, Democrats, uh, lawmakers here in in Texas, uh, sent to the governor, calling for a special session to um, address the the laws on the books. And, and among the ideas uh, was raising the the, the age limit. Uh, but also regulating uh, people's ability to have access or gain access to uh, high-capacity magazines, um, as well as red flag laws that would allow a court to temporarily uh, take guns away from, from, from anyone who is deemed a, a danger to themselves or, or the public. As you heard Rachel talking about on the more national level, here in Texas, they're having uh, the same conversation because as it stands right now, there is no red flag law uh, in place here. And it was something that Governor Abbott actually asked the lawmakers here to consider back in 2018 after the shooting at the Santa Fe High School, where, as you recall, Lindsay, 10 people were killed there. In response to that shooting, the governor was announcing a plan to address the issues, and that in included discussion about the red flag laws. But he faced pushback and uh, people who said that that would not work and that it would potentially infringe uh, upon uh, Second Amendment rights. So it's an idea uh, that fizzled out here in Texas, but it is once again being discussed or uh, talked about here uh, in response to what happened in Uvalde. And Marcus Moore for us in Texas. Thanks so much for your coverage all week. Uh, Marcus, we appreciate it again. Uh, President Biden addressing the nation tonight, talking about the need for some kind of gun reform. In short, his overall summary really was this time we have to do something. The Senate has to do something. We'll be right back. The you go into the black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. 
The Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, also known as OPEC, is and its partner nations have agreed to speed up oil production. OPEC Plus promised to increase its oil supply by 50% more in July and August, which would add 648,000 barrels a day. Analysts say the increase won't solve the gas price crisis, but that it will help. Protesters demonstrated in Sao Paulo to demand justice for the death of a black man after he was asphyxiated with gas in the trunk of a police car last week. The video of Geni Valdo de Jesus Santos' death became viral, causing outrage across Brazil. The images captured on phone camera showed police officers bundling the handcuffed man into the trunk of their SUV, releasing a gas canister inside and leaning down on the trunk door until his screams and dangling legs came to a stop. Thousands marched the streets of Jerusalem for the annual Gay Pride Parade. More than 2,400 police officers were deployed to protect marchers and secure the planned route of the parade after organizers of the march received death threats on Twitter and Facebook, according to Israeli media. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. June, of course, kicks off Pride Month, and our next guest has made a name for himself, sharing videos about the LGBTQ plus culture and social conventions. Rob Anderson, known online as At Heart Robert, is an activist, comedian, musician, and the creator of the hit TikTok series, Gay Science. He looks into why gay men like iced coffee, what is gaydar, and much more, earning him more than two million followers and nearly 70 million likes on TikTok. Rob joins us now. So good to have you here. Rob, I didn't even know that iced coffee was a thing. <laughs> well, uh, Lindsay, it is. <laughs> it is, and uh, a lot of gay men love it. I mean, I knew that iced coffee was a thing. I just didn't know that it was like a thing for like any particular group. I thought that everybody liked iced coffee. Um, so I you was like, well you don't know about iced coffee? Uh, yeah, right. I know about it in, in, in the general sense. Uh, you're, of course, uh, well known for your viral series, Gay Sirens. What, what inspired you to make those videos? Um, well, thank you, Lizzie. I, uh, well, by the way, I love your blazer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's really this old fierce. Thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to have fun with the gay stereotypes that exist because some of them are so silly. Uh, and the things that I ended up hearing, like, uh, if gay men color their hair, they must be in an emotional crisis, or that gay people can either be best friends or mortal enemies at work as coworkers and nothing in between. I wanted to explain those things with fake science, basically. And and Pride Month is, of course, all about celebrating and protecting the rights that queer people have. Yet several states, including, as you know, Florida and Texas, are enacting what some people call anti-queer laws. What kind of support is the LGBTQ plus community looking for as these laws are now debated? Yeah, I think uh, equality is at the very core of all of these debates. And uh, treating queer people how non-queer people have been treated. Um, those laws in particular, like don't say gay, uh, the don't say gay bill in Florida, um, uh, choose to ignore something that straight people can talk about. In Disney movies, there's romance, um, a, a straight, uh, teacher can talk about their husband, uh, but it's suddenly different when someone's not straight. So I think that's the kind of support they're looking for. And, and I want to turn for a moment to your music career. You recently debuted a song titled Nothing For You. Let's take a listen. And you call this song a gay rights anthem. Explain to us the message behind your lyrics. Sure. Um, so a lot of the work that I do uh, takes things and kind of flips them on their head. Uh, it finds a lot of joy in stupidity, per se. Uh, and I think that queer people deserve to laugh at things. And in a month where things are very serious and the things we're fighting for are very serious, I wanted to be a little more playful. So I took the mentality of finding someone so attractive and so desired that they could reduce you to absolutely nothing and you would enjoy that, uh, which is a sort of, um, kink and statement a lot in the queer community. A lot of people have fun with this sort of uh, sentiment. So I wanted to have a, a play on that.
And, and you actively use your platform as a form of both self-expression and activism through comedy, most recently being cast in Discovery Plus's upcoming series, A Book of Queer, uh, a series about gay history that tells the stories of gay heroes throughout time. Why do you think that gay entertainment is, is becoming so much more mainstream? It, it seems really just in the last few years. Yeah, it really has, and it's been incredible to watch. I think that what people tend to forget is that queer people have a variety of perspectives and different lived experiences, and when we have certain forms of entertainment, they don't reflect everybody in the queer community, but they shouldn't have to. Um, everyone has their own lived experiences. So as we have these new shows that come up, uh, movies, all sorts of entertainment, there are different people's perspectives on things, um, which is really cool to see. It doesn't have to reflect mine. Um, it, it only reflects theirs. You're also an author, a man clearly of many hats. You have a book titled The Ferg American National Anthem, a nod to the 2018 rendition of the Star Spangled Banner at the NBA All-Star Game, performed, of course, by singer Fergie. Spangled Banner, yet uh, what compelled you to write this book, and, and has Fergie reached out to you about it? Lindsay, the idea came from an it's an iconic uh, rendition that a lot of people had fun making fun of online. And I like to take those things that people drag and find the joy in it. So I wrote a children's book where every page was uh, what it sounded like Fergie was saying uh, to kind of make fun of a situation that is really qu quite silly. Uh, and people kind of uh, really, really enjoyed that. And Fergie as well had commented something really fun related to the book that she was craving brie cheese, which is one of the jokes in the book. So it was cool to get her affirmation. And that our flag was still there. Uh, what advice would you give to someone queer or otherwise who wants to become a creative and, and be an activist? Yeah. Um, have fun, uh, and I know that sounds kind of uh, generic, but a lot of the times when you want to start creating, uh, it can feel like you're building your own little business. And I think being authentic to yourself and keeping the fun in everything you post will lead you to better things, even though sometimes there's ups and downs with it. Um, and focus on the positive. There's going to be a lot of people throwing their opinions at you, and if you're doing the right thing and getting a lot of attention, people might send you some negative things. Don't worry about it. Stick to the positive. Good advice for us all. Rob, thank you so much for joining us for our series this week. Rob's latest single, Nothing For You, is out now. Thanks, Lindsay. Watching the potential of HBCU students take flight. Major airlines are now partnering with schools to bring diversity to the skies. Reporter Jason Whiteley with our partner station WFAA brings us inside the program in tonight's local lowdown. 2207 RNAV mirrors on my 31 right cliff takeoff. Ever since he can remember, Anthony Pumphrey Jr. wanted to be a pilot. I blame my dad for this one. Uh, my dad worked for the airlines. Uh, story goes, two weeks old, they threw me in an airplane. I never wanted to get back out since. He flew his first plane at age eight and now has his commercial pilot's license as a freshman in college at Texas Southern University. For me, a lot of times, even today, whenever I fly, I look out that window, I look down, and I'm like, whoa. Anthony is just the kind of student that Southwest Airlines wants to keep track of. Southwest just announced a partnership with TSU. In school, students will earn more than just a pilot certificate, but also a bachelor's degree. After getting experience with smaller airlines, those TSU graduates can then apply at Southwest. And all along the way, they are mentored by Southwest pilots. There are nine HBCUs with aviation programs, only three of them that own their own airplanes. Texas Southern University owns our own airplanes. But why Texas Southern? It's an HBCU, a historically black college or university. And like every airline right now, Southwest is trying to diversify its pool of pilots. We know that we have work to do and need to do and really and truly want to do from a pilot perspective. We do want to have a diverse work group. We want to represent not only the customers, but the communities that we fly to. Diversifying the cockpit is not just a Southwest issue. The majority of all commercial airline pilots right now are white men. They make up about 94% of the total. Black pilots are 3.4% and even more scarce are minority women. Um, nobody in my family flies, so it was kind of a shock to them. Like my mom tells me, I never thought you would 
consider being a pilot, but for me, it just I was a natural curiosity. I was always curious about space and an aircraft. Catherine Cabrera attends TSU and is among the students already applying to join the Southwest program there. Last year, United Airlines started a similar initiative with three HBCUs. In February, Delta announced it was doing one too. Then in March, Southwest joined Texas Southern. And one day, one day, when I'm with my family, I know, I know it's going to happen. I'm going to be walking down the concourse of some airport somewhere, and I'm going to see one of these TSU students. Realistically, it could take close to a decade to go from TSU student to Southwest pilot. But this is a long play for all involved. The airline will need new pilots in the future, and graduates are always looking for a place to land. In Dallas, I'm Jason Whiteley. Getting their wings. Our thanks to Jason for that. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us.